Ja, good afternoon or good morning. Yeah, afternoon soon. Um, lunch time, and this is not the best way of presenting a long story. But uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the WebSlam uh, consortium, I will uh, present some the WebSlam experiment. My name is Erwin Arntgen, and I was uh, appointed uh, responsible for getting extra funding from sponsors to make this uh, experiment possible by this extra type of instrumentation. The, the HydroLab consortium was very willing to support the building and the running of the experiments, but uh, we needed much more, much more uh, instrumentation than the EU could provide. So uh, my co-author of the paper for this is uh, Ove Gudmestad. Uh, he's sitting here somewhere, yes. And uh, this is a truss structure. We see the yellow structural part there. It's uh, a model of a substructure for a wind turbine offshore. And the idea for this came out of uh, the design of a substructure for the Thornton Bank. And uh, uh, the engineering consultant company, Rainerchen in Trondheim, Norway, uh, we yeah, discussed this with late uh, Alf Turum and over Tobias Goodmester and see if it could be a good idea to have a large scale test of such a structure because breaking waves at Thornton Bank should be included in the, the design of the structure. So the contents of my presentation will be a little bit about the motivation and goal. I have a little bit of a background, what they have done before we went to the large scale facility. We did some small model tests, um, description of the Waveslam project, and uh, then we have done some analysis uh, of the project. We have, but uh, the funding for the project did not include uh, research hours afterwards, so uh, we actually need to have uh, more activity by master thesis, PhD thesis, and so on on this data set, which is quite unique. And but at the end, I will give you some conclusions. So why trust structures? Well, they seem very nice to have an option to the monopods, in, especially in shallow water. In the, and the, the trust structure you see here, uh, uh, around here, this is um, some columns and with some bar bracings. And this part is what we have considered. We have not considered the load coming from the top structure of the wind turbine. The question is this formula for the slamming forces, which has been used, and where this factor here, CS, which is the slamming factor, and the lambda, which is called the curling factor, representing how much of the crest height is actually um, influencing the structure when it hits. So this uh, simplification is for uh, a slender cylinder. And then what is the value of lambda? Maybe somewhere in between 0 0.3 and 1. Uh, what, what is the value of CS? Maybe somewhere between pi and 2 pi. So it seems to be very crucial to know uh, which values will be, pre will be let's say, uh, to be used if you have a truss structure because these values here are obtained for typical cylindrical structures. So the ultimate goal would then be then to uh, method, improve the methods to calculate slamming forces on truss structures. So this is a kind of idea. We have, if it waves doesn't break, we will just have what we call a Morrison type formula that we could use uh, for calculation the wave forces. But uh, if you have a, a breaking wave hitting the structure, we typically will get an increased uh, high uh, value of the forces. Now, these tests are, unfortunately, uh, with the instrumentation we use are kind of dynamic systems. And the natural period of oscillation of this instrumentation we use is maybe a longer time than the duration of the force. So we have some problems with, uh, with uh, we have an inverse problem. We know the response, we would like to know the force. So that uh, is the big issue here and the, the challenges we meet uh, in this uh, kind of analysis. 
Some previous results here. Uh, this was some experiment we did over flume, small scale flume. Um, this is a 6 centimeter diameter cylinder. It was instrumented with different uh, load cells. We ran it in a uh, in, uh, wave period in the flume, 2.2 seconds, and the uh, breaking wave at the circle was 27 centimeters. And then we found this value. Oh, sorry. Uh, we found this value in the, uh, one more in the lab. Uh, we calculated uh, inverse methods, 36 newtons on this. Then we compared it with different theories presented by other authors. And this one, Wink and Omarashi, is actually the one that has gone into one of the guidelines to calculate uh, the forces. And it was quite much higher. And uh, this is uh, then the challenge. Uh, why is it higher? And, and so on. We did also a model test in a small scale, uh, 1 to 50, on a truss structure similar to the one that is tested in, in the large scale uh, testing. And uh, also here, using the standard methods for calculating the, the load of the total structure, uh, we got uh, guidelines of 102 newtons. We measured only a quarter of that. So. What is it? The methodology to, to in the guidelines like it's too conservative, or is it? Uh, well, we need to look a little bit more into this. So we have started then to how to analyze the data. In the inverse method we are using a frequency uh, response um, um, method, and uh, we use a filtering using the filter the signal and then using a Duhamel kind of integration and by trial and error find the, the force required to give this kind of response. And then we'll come back to that a little bit later. The problem in this, uh, with this, as I mentioned before, is that we are in this range in this diagram. This diagram shows the ratio between impulse duration, I mean this spike you just saw, the duration of that compared to the period or natural period of vibration for the instrument or for the load cell. The load cell has a higher or a longer um, longer period than the the impulse duration. So the duration here you can say for a triangular load is this time, but the period of oscillation is longer time. So therefore we are in this range and then the shape of the impulse will have an influence of the, of the ratio we measure. So typically people think maybe if you have a dynamic system, you have a forcing and then the response is two times that. That's a kind of general uh, impression that people can go with. But here you see actually if you are here you have a lower value in response than you have as a as a peak force of your impact. So, so this value, the peak force here, uh, is then measured, uh, is not measured, but what is measured is the response of the sensor. So uh, this is the challenge we meet. Um, we'll come back to that later in the results. We're describing the experiment. We were then lucky to get access to the large wave channel in Hanover. And we installed this uh, model structure, 2.2 meters wide in the square, and about four meter high. And we put it in this uh, basin. We made a slope. Uh, and the water level on the, on, on the structure, it was about 1.82 meter. We varied that a little bit. Total water level in, in the constant depth part of the channel was this. We had a total of 21 combined wave gauges and control of the wave paddle signal. And we had then instrumented uh, this system here with a lot of force transducers. I will come back to this force transducers in the next slide. This one shows the wave gauges here with the red and some acoustic Doppler velocity meters with the green points here. 
here shows uh, different sides of the structure. We have the front panel or a front view of the structure. We have the left side of the structure. We have the right side of the structure. And uh, there were instrumented bracing, so we actually cut out the welded bracing, so we didn't produce the welded bracings here and here. So the, uh, the, these ones were bracings that were instrumented both on the left side and on the right side. So they were mounted on four transducers connected to these columns and to this cross. And uh, we were able then to measure horizontal forces and kind of the normal forces to the axis. So it's forces in this direction, horizontal and normal to the surface. Because hydrodynamic forces then it's normal to the surface. So we didn't me measure the structural forces. That means actual forces were not measured in these. Uh, it was a kind of cost problem. Uh, it was quite, we had to make special instruments there produced by HBM. And uh, it was very expensive uh, for stress users. So we have uh, the, the, the structure was hung up in a joint here at the beam across the, across the channel. And it was hanging freely. And it was controlled by horizontal force transducers here at the, the left side view and the right side view. You can see it there. So there was a small gap between the bottom of the channel to the structure. We did also something we call hammer test to have get, uh, get the transfer functions uh, at different parts of the structure using a very small hammer for the front leg where you have these local transducers. Small transducers that are 50 millimeter high cut into the test sections here and here. And you have on the structure itself, and then that was recorded by these total four cells on the four corners on the different uh, places. And we have also uh, on the bracings, we did these kind of hammer tests as indicated by these stars here and here and here and so on. Yeah. We did this test with, but both with water and without water because when you're doing analysis of the structure, it's important to know if, 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 if the legs were flooded or not. These were open legs, so, so when it's put in water, the legs and bracings were filled with water. When it was dry, it was out water. So. so these are some of the results we have. These are the, the wave at the structure and the total response. That is this kind of sum of the four, four, four stars users measured in each corner. And we then have several. These are 10 events in one run. and. Uh, we have done some analysis of the last one, and that's uh, a, uh, uh, we have a report and post it to, to, uh, to this project on this. So this is the method of filtering and uh, using hammer test uh, results. So we do first the filtering to have the kind of um, Morrison type force, the green curve. Then we subtract the green curve from the total response, and then we are obtaining kind of the time series of the response. Then we do the Fourier transform of this uh, time series. We have obtained from the hammer test a transfer function for this part of the structure. And then uh, we can generate a kind of time series of the forcing by doing the inverse Fourier transform of the ratio between the spectrum of the response divided by the transfer function from the hammer test. And this is then quite noisy. And still, we need to improve these methods to find a better. But based on this, we say, OK, this range from 0 up here is about 8 kilonewtons. If you are a little bit, say, OK, maybe we should take it from here. And up here, it's 14 kilonewtons. So that's what we got here from the, this test. If you then calculate the same thing using standard guidelines for this, we obtain 56 
killing mutants for this uh, analysis of the total forces. So still there are, at least I've just preliminary analysis, uh, not double checked for errors uh, and so on, but it indicates the need for uh, kind of more investigations on, on this uh, kind of structures. Uh, do I have more time? Five more? Okay. Another analysis we did was um, that we had a master students now doing some work uh, on this uh, data. First, he was looking at simultaneous actions on pressure forces or responses on the front bracings and on some local force transducers on this. So actually on this level here and on this level here. The for uh, this bracing were instrumented with a force transducer here and here, so you have needed both of them to get the total force. Interesting here, this lower graph shows uh, the time series of the response force of this one transducer down here and this one up here. And what we observe here is that the wave uh, action uh, hits a lower part first and then sometimes later, a few milliseconds, these are, uh, there are 20 milliseconds between here. And therefore, do we have this force appearing this time? This force, of course, penetrates also to the lower uh, by the structural response. So uh, this part here is maybe not the direct hit of the wave at the, at the lower, lower part of the bracing. Maybe it's more a response to the forcing in the upper part of the bracing. So this is something we would like to investigate a little bit more, and we made then uh, uh, an uh, model of the of the of the structure. First, we try to make it globally behave in a similar manner to the total structure by playing around with some stiffness and damping and so on to find a reasonable good match uh, with. Uh, with uh, the behavior. It was more or less a trial error with uh, these uh, Young's modulus and uh, yeah, mainly. And some local variations of densities uh, because this instrumented part, some part, main structure was made in steel, but uh, the instrumented parts were, some parts were made in, in, uh, in aluminum uh, solid aluminium and other parts were then these uh, bracings that were instrumented and these are just uh, half plates or circular plates that were uh, mounted uh, by screws to the, to the, to the structure. So we concentrated on looking at, the, looking at the different part of the bracing. The bracing is here. We have an upper action of the, of the wave. We can divide it in this part and in this part. And now I was showing some results, just a result for what happens to this part of a bracing. And uh, so we're looking at the impact area, upper part, with these uh, dimensions here. So this is a trial error, fail and error method by assuming a load, a time series of a load that starts with an abrupt change. And this, uh, and then a typical length and a specific height. So the specific height here is denominated by F0, and the total length here is the tau. And then by varying tau and varying uh, F0, several combinations, uh, we ended up uh, with a load history like this. And we said, we feel that this is a very good match. We put an uh, objective measurement for this, what is the, is the difference in peak force and the timing of occurrence of this uh, maximum force. And we said there should be minimum at the same time, but one has to, it's, we could have get this better, but then this will be worse, and vice versa, and this could be better, but then this will be worse. So it's a kind of optimization problem, and this we're going to continue with, with a PhD study on uh, how to optimize this, uh, this, uh, this. 
but it seems that uh, we are on the right track and we can do some analysis uh, with uh, this such kind of model. Maybe it's the best way to do it in ANSYS, but uh, still we are going to, to do that with a similar model in the future. So a unique data set relevant to both our theoretical understanding of shallow water wave forces and application in coastal engineering and offshore wind energy project has been obtained. For now, this is the only data set of in the world, to my knowledge. Um, analysis of the data is primarily the responsibility of the consortium through projects, master thesis, and PhD activities. Um, so far, analysis carried out indicate that the wave slamming forces are much less well use estimated using guidelines. Further, Detailed analysis with different analysis methods would be recommended to overcome many uncertainties and to come up with better conclusions. Research groups are invited to request data for analysis, as all efforts are welcome to understand these important data. The fully instrumented test structure is stored at FZK for at least two more years, and it's available for continued research at this facility. So. Thank you for your attention and some questions. Okay, is there any question, please? Okay, I have one. Just measure it or pressure measure it on vertical breakwaters or on the uh, they are uh, importantly related to the acquisition frequencies. So, uh, Dimitri has presented uh, acquisition frequencies of uh, 1,000 um, 1, Hz and 4,000 Hz. Do you think that uh, this can affect some of the results? Well, first, knowing which is the, pre the, the acquisition frequency, and later knowing if you have previous experience when increasing the acquisition frequency in order to see well, we which is the peaks of the, uh, of the pressure measurements. So, uh, we tried 20,000 hertz, but uh, the system didn't take that. We had a total of 70, 76 uh, sensors. Uh, 21 of them was around for 200 hertz, but the rest was uh, 10,000 hertz. Okay, and so then you know which is the, the difference that you can record or the, the statically different that you can uh, extract when working at 10,000 uh, 10, hertz and when working at lower acquisition frequencies. Yeah, I could do that probably in uh, resampling. Okay. It's possible. So this data should be. Uh, possible to do this kind of analysis with. Because I know people that has the other way around. They have acquired data at low resolution and then yeah. later they struggle because the peaks of the energy and the peaks of the, well, the peaks of the pressures and the peak of the forces, they just appear at really instant moments. And then if you do not have enough time resolution, then you are not able to capture that. So, so yeah. then you need to or either increase the acquisition frequency, which in more times it's not possible, or just increase the time series in order to capture these peaks. So you see here, for some few milliseconds, we have several points, dots. You see these are uh, markers for each sample. You see the... And do some comparisons. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any other question? Hi, um, Frank and Arachi, I believe, used um, plunging waves, didn't they? Is that what you were able to use in the GWK? We, uh, we were doing plunging breakers, yes. Okay. And we did some tests also with the artificial uh, waves, uh, as you saw in the previous presentation. It was during the same test campaign. The test campaign was last year in June. We had five weeks total, about two weeks for testing. So it's not the fact that you had different breaker types that might explain um, your uh, lower forces? Uh, what uh, we think is that, uh, for example, the test by Wienke and Omurasi, they did their test with a cylinder with an artificial uh, wave, and um, 
I have a hypothesis that, uh, and I have not investigated it, but uh, I think the, the shape of these artificial waves has some different characteristics than a uh, plunging breaker on a sloping bottom. Okay, thank you. I'll probably look a little into that, but I have not, I have not looked into it yet.